Welcome everyone. This is Women Who Cope Python. Our main mission is, is a global nonprofit dedicated to inspire women to excel in technology careers. Our goals are to empower with the skill needed for professional achievement, educate companies to better promote, retain and hire talented women, build a global community where networking and mentorship is value, and develop role models and support this generation of engineers. This is our code of conduct. This is an inclusive community. It's dedicated to empower experience for everyone who wants to participate and support our community, regardless gender, identity, expression, ability, physical appearance, anything. So everyone is always welcome as, as, long, as, as long as they support our main goal. Women Who Code has different tracks. We have front end, we have blockchain, we have Python, which is us. We have mobile, cloud, and we have also data science. All of them, they help events online every month. We want to thank our sponsors, which is McKinsey and Company, Python Software Foundation, The Home Depot, and Atlassian. So let's go ahead and get it started. So tonight, well, tonight for me, for other people might not be tonight, uh, this is Beyond Unit Test to End Web UI Testing by Andrew Knight. And a little bit about him. He's a software engineer. He's especially is building test automation systems from the ground up which involves both software development for test code as well as the infrastructure to run a continuous integrations. He also does web dev and tool dev from time to time and love databases and compiler theory. His main programming languages are Python, Java, C Sharp, and JavaScript. As well as this is his website, automationpanda.com, where he shared all his experience and even he has recipes there. So you can go ahead and check it out after. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm gonna give it to you. Welcome to Andrew. So thank you all very much for inviting me here tonight to give this webinar. I'm, I'm really excited, I'm really grateful. And so let's talk about beyond unit testing, end-to-end -end web UI testing. My name is Andy Knight. And in Python circles, I go by the nickname Pandy. I love all things about software, particularly testing and automation. My day job is that I'm the lead software engineer in test at Precision Letter, a Q2 company in Raleigh, North Carolina, where uh, Precision Lender makes a web app to help bankers make better loans. You can follow me on Twitter at Automation Panda, and you can also check me out at my blog at automationpanda.com. So as I said, I love testing, but there's something that kind of breaks my heart. <laughs> I've noticed an unfortunate trend within our industry, whereby a lot of people seem to think that unit testing is the only kind of testing there is. Now unit testing is great, but it only goes so far. And I get this vibe when I talk to developers, when I talk to people who aren't as familiar with testing, and it, it pops up in all sorts of ways. And I don't think I'm ill-founded to say this. If you look at the Python developer survey from 2018, this survey is one where the Python Software Foundation teamed up with JetBrains to survey all people who love Python, just to get data on what the Python community is doing, what tools are popular, what frameworks are in, and one of the questions in the 2018 survey was, what test frameworks do you use in Python? When I hit this question, I got excited because I'm, I'm like, oh, wow, there's a question about testing. Yes. And so I put my answer in, and weeks later, we get the results. And you can see the results online. I've put the link down here. If you just Google it, you'll find it. They give this beautiful breakdown of all the data they, they gathered. But when it came to the, the testing frameworks section, they labeled it as testing frameworks. But then in the description, as you can see here, they called them unit testing frameworks. 
And that's when my heart broke because a lot of these frameworks can be used for more than unit testing. And I just kind of shook my head. So let's dig into this difference. Why, why is unit testing not all encompassing? There is a difference between testing code and testing features. I'm gonna say that again because it's important. There is a difference between testing code and testing features. When we test code, we're talking about white box testing, where we're directly calling the functions, the methods, the variables, and the classes in the product code under test. And testing code is meant to answer one primary question. Is the code written to do expected things? If I have a function and I shove in all the various combinations and permutations of inputs, do I get the expected return value? That's what a white box test is supposed to do. It's meant to make sure that the code is doing what we want the code to do. There are two primary kinds of white box tests. There are unit tests, which test individual units, like a method or a function. And there's also subcutaneous tests, which will test a, a flow through several calls. That's a very distinct type of testing from testing features, which we call black box testing. Unlike unit tests, which have direct access to the code, black box tests do not. Instead, black box tests are interacting with a live version of the product. That could be a web application loaded up in Chrome, or it could be maybe making REST API calls to a service API and checking response codes and response bodies. The purpose of a black box feature test is to answer the question, does the product meet the requirements? This is more like a user driven type um, test or a, a, an end user verification, right? This is where our integration tests and our end to end tests come. We're putting a real live version of the thing out there and we're trying to interact with it like a user. And we're trying to make sure that this feature or this product delivers on its business value and functions appropriate. Not to look at to see if a function returns the proper value, to make but rather to make sure that the feature works as we intended. So two very different kinds of testing. So in this webinar, we're gonna look specifically at web UI testing. What is web UI testing? Well, it's a black box type of testing for a web application through a live browser. We consider this feature testing because it tests the app like a human user. Web UI tests will log into your application, they will click buttons, they will um, scrape text, navigate through pages, all that kind of stuff. We also would call web UI testing end to end because it needs all the parts of the web application to be exercised together, right? A web application is a fairly complex system. You have the JavaScript and HTML and CSS on the front end. You have your backend service layer. You probably have a um, web server and maybe a load balancer in between. You have the browser itself. And then you probably have databases and persistence layers way, way down the stack. So all that needs to be there in order to do a true web UI end-to-end -end test. Oops. Since web UI testing is expensive, we want to make sure that we focus our efforts on good return on investment. Like we saw before, there's that big difference between testing code and testing features. Usually unit tests are very low level. They're very short. The average unit test is probably single digits in line length. They'll test a very small function or method and there, are, there should be no dependencies. However, a web UI test is going to have a lot of dependencies because like we just said, you need that full stack moving and dancing together. Web UI tests are also um, more complicated to 
write and automate. Uh, they need extra technologies to get that done. They can also be a bit flakier because we need to handle things like race conditions and when the page changes from underneath of us. So there are extra concerns we need to take with good web UI test automation. And finally, web UI tests also take a long time to run. Whereas a unit test might take a fraction of a second, like a millisecond. The typical web UI test is probably taking half a minute to a minute long to complete. So with that extra burden of cost, we want to make sure that we focus on return on investment. If we're going to take the time and dedicate the resources to running web UI tests, then let's make sure they're good and valuable ones. So we probably want to focus on the most important behaviors. We want to focus on individual independent behaviors so that when the test fails, we know exactly what the reason was. We don't want to focus so much on edge cases or very, very minuscule details in our application. We want to hit the core functionality, the things that our users do most, the things that ultimately bring the most value to the application. So even though web UI testing can be hard because it is a bit complex, let's make it easy by the power of Python. Here's what our solution for a test automation solution will look like. We must recognize that test automation is a special domain of software development, right? Just like we develop web applications and microservices and command line tools, test automation needs the same best practices. We should have code reviews. We should apply design patterns. We should try to avoid repeating ourselves in the code. We should make sure that things scale. And so all those practices will apply to test automation here. Our language of choice for today will be Python because this is women who code Python and Python is an amazing language. I absolutely love it. Our core test framework will be PyTest. PyTest is not only one of the most popular test automation frameworks in Python, but in my opinion, it's also one of the best test automation frameworks in any major language. For our web UI interactions, we will use a design pattern called the page object pattern. And we'll see some code around that in a little bit. And finally, for our browser automation, the thing that's actually going to poke Chrome or Firefox or Safari, we're going to use a tool called Selenium WebDriver. Now, you may or may not have heard of Selenium WebDriver before, but Selenium WebDriver is the de facto standard for this type of web UI testing. In Python, you get Selenium WebDriver by the lowercase Selenium package. But WebDriver has implementations in pretty much all the major programming languages, whether it's Java, C Sharp, Ruby, or JavaScript, or even some others, I believe. What's nice is across all the different languages, the WebDriver API is fairly standard. In fact, WebDriver as a protocol is a W3C standard, and Selenium is simply one of the most popular open source implementations of the WebDriver standard. So how does Selenium WebDriver work? Well, you'll write up your browser interactions in your Python code using the WebDriver API for things like clicks and get text and find elements. And we'll see these calls in a little bit. And WebDriver will send your commands from your test automation code to that live browser. And what's nice is WebDriver can handle every type of web UI interaction, no matter if it's a click, a scroll, a select, it's all supported and all included. And I also recommend that since um, these web driver calls tend to be a little bit low level, we do want to make sure to make all of our web driver calls using the page object pattern rather than redundantly repeating ourselves. Now, I can't cover the entire web driver API in half hour to an hour's worth of webinar. There's just too much there. 
We will see some of the most common and basic calls together tonight, but I recommend that you go look at some of the documentation after our webinar if you'd like to learn more. Frequently, I find myself referring to this page. This is what our test automation solution would look like if we sketched it out in a diagram. On the left, we'll have one-to-many PyTest test cases. Each test case should be focusing on an individual independent behavior. Inside of our test cases, we'll be making calls to our page objects, which will model the interactions with the web application under test. Inside page object methods, we'll be making web driver calls. And so the web driver bindings for Selenium will then call out to this thing in the middle, which we'll call our web driver proxy. If we're going to do local testing, meaning testing from our local machine, we will need what's called a web driver executable installed on our system path. Every browser has one. For Chrome, it's Chrome driver. For IE, it's IE driver. For Firefox, it's Gecko driver. And I believe for Safari, it's built in. What this proxy does is it will receive calls from your test automation and then communicate those calls to the live browser under test. So it'll wake up Chrome and it'll send it that click. And then once Chrome makes the click for you, it'll send the response back through the proxy and then back to your test automation. Now you can also do web driver remotely. After about two or three concurrent tests on your local machine, you'll find it probably maxes out and slows down a lot. But there is this tool called Selenium Grid that lets you move your web drivers off to remote machines. So that way you can massively parallelize your tests. Maybe you can run 10 tests or 20 tests or even more tests all simultaneously. And furthermore, Selenium Grid lets you configure multiple operating systems with multiple browser types and multiple version levels. You can choose to set up Selenium Grid by yourself. It is a free and open source tool. Or you can also choose to pay for it as a service. Companies like Sauce Labs or Browser Stack or Cross Browser Testing or Lambda Test all provide Selenium Grid as a service so that you don't need to maintain that infrastructure. You just make requests from your test automation to get browsers that you want. So with all this head knowledge and background information, let's write a basic web test together. In this webinar, we're going to write one test case from top to bottom. And then after this webinar, you can take that code and extend it with more tests. I always, always, always recommend write your test steps before you write your test code. A lot of people will try to jump right into test automation code at the beginning and then they'll write a steaming pile of crap that is no good because they didn't think before they coded. So always, always write your test steps out before you test your, write your test code. The web application we're going to test today is DuckDuckGo. It's a basic search engine, just like Google. You type in your search phrases and then you'll get result links. The reason I've chosen DuckDuckGo for us to test tonight is for three main reasons. First of all, it's freely available. Secondly, it has a very, very simple interface. And third, pretty much everyone knows how to use a search engine. So we don't have to get hung up on behavior details. So let's, let's step through our test case together that we're gonna automate. We're gonna automate a test case for a very, very basic search. So the first step is we'll need to navigate to the DuckDuckGo homepage, typing it in the browser, hitting enter, and waiting for the page to load. Our second step will be to enter, enter a search phrase. Here I'm entering Panda as an example. Once we enter that search phrase, the results page will appear with all the links. We'll need to make a few verifications on the result page to make sure our search was successful. First of all, 
we will verify that the query in the title matches our search query. Next, we'll make sure that the query is in the search input on the results page. And finally, we'll make sure that all of the results somehow pertain to our search query. This is probably the most important check because we want to make sure we're not getting garbage for search results. Now, this is a very, very simple test. You may be wondering, well, is it even worth doing this kind of test if it's so simple? And I would argue yes, because sometimes even the most basic tests are the most important because they'll give you the clearest feedback for problems when they fail. If we can't do a search, a basic search with our DuckDuckGo search engine, then almost nothing else is going to work with DuckDuckGo. So it's, it's a very, very valuable test, even though it's simple. And furthermore, if we wanted to cover other behaviors, such as maybe clicking links or taking image searches, then we would write separate test cases because we want each test to be as atomic and individual and independent and singularly focused as possible. Keep things simple. Now that we have our test case steps, let's start to code them up in PyTest. As I said before, PyTest is one of the most popular frameworks in Python for testing, and also one of my favorite frameworks in any language. PyTest is awesome because it is Pythonic. It is simple, it is concise, yet it is powerful and flexible. Here, I've taken a screenshot from the PyTest docs homepage. And you can see here, this test answer is a very, very simple test case. It's a function, not a class or a method. It's prefixed with test underscore. And it simply calls things and makes assertions. That's all there is to PyTest. If you were to put this in a module, PyTest would discover it, execute it, and report that this would be failing because three plus one is not equal to five. Just like with Selenium, I'm not gonna go into too, too much deep detail about the PyTest framework itself, but I will point out things when we go through the code together. If you want to learn more about PyTest, I recommend, first of all, reading the docs online. And if you want a deeper dive, then I recommend one of these two books. Python Testing with PyTest by Brian Aachen is the PyTest user's manual. Well, de facto. It's got everything well documented on all the ins and outs of PyTest. How you write test functions, how you do fixtures, how you can write plugins, so on and so forth. PyTest Quick Start Guide by Bruno Oliveira is more of an introductory tutorial to PyTest, but also to test automation frameworks in general. So both books are excellent. I, I stand by both of them. I've read both of them myself. So you won't go wrong with either choice. When we go to write our test case in PyTest, we'll need to write, we'll, we'll need to create a test folder. And in that test folder, we'll need to create a Python module named test underscore something. And in our test module, we'll need to add our test underscore functions. And those will be our test cases that PyTest will discover when we go to run our tests. What I like to do when I start writing a new test is I will create a stub for that test function and I will put all of the steps, the test case steps that we spelled out in comments into that test function. And then I'll usually put to do comments right beneath each one. And as I automate those steps and I write the Python code, I'll get rid of the to do's, but I'll leave the commented given when then steps. Why? Because that helps frame what the test case is. So without further ado, let's jump in and see some code. I've uploaded all of the code to, my, to a GitHub repository. In fact, I'm going to be using the, this project or 
rather this, how can I say this? Back up, back up. I've given this tutorial a couple times. I've given it at PyOhio 2019. I've given it at DjangoCon 2019. I hope to be giving it at PyCon 2019 in Pittsburgh, PyCon 2020 in Pittsburgh. Um, and also, it will be part of an upcoming Test Automation University course. So all the code is on my GitHub. If you go to my GitHub user account at andylpk247, and you go to the TAU Intro Selenium PY repository, you'll find everything there. And so, oops, if I switch over right now, I will show you the GitHub repository here, TAU Intro Selenium PY. If you go to the master branch and you go to the README, you'll see that this repository itself is meant to be a tutorial. It shows you how to do the setup for all the code. It shows you how to set up WebDriver on your local machine, how, to, how the branching of this repo works. And then you'll see course instructions where I've broken this out into nine chapters. And if you just follow along and do the code yourself, you'll go through basically everything I'm about to show you in the code. You'll be writing your test case, you'll be setting up the fixtures, you'll be writing page objects. And this tutorial goes even further than we'll go tonight by showing you how to do browser config files, how to handle race conditions with um, multiple browsers, and then also how you can use parallel, how you can do parallel testing rather than running tests one at a time. So this repo will be part of my upcoming Test Automation University course, but you can start using this README today and using the code. There's example code in every single one of the branches lined up with every single one of the steps in the course. So I hope that helps. Let's get into the code here. So I'm using Visual Studio Code for my Python project here. And I hope the text is gonna be big enough, I've enlarged it. So I have my project, intro Selenium PY, and I have it open to the, the um, sixth chapter in the course, just to keep things simple. I want you to take a look at this project layout because project layout is very important for Python projects. Oops. Oh gosh, Boom. okay, let me close all this down. So whenever we make Python, or whenever we write PyTest test cases, what we should do in our project root directory is create a tests folder. And in here is where we'll put our test modules. I also want to point out the dependencies that our package will need, or uh, that our project will need. You can use something like uh, a virtual environment and then create a requirements.txt file. But for this project, I chose to use pipenv. And when you use pipenv, pipenv install, it'll create a pip file for you, which is basically a glorified requirements.txt. The two packages that we'll need for this project are PyTest and Selenium, both of them available from pip. They'll suck in a whole bunch of other dependencies with them, but these are simply the two we need at the top level. Also just note, I'm using Python 3.8. You should be able to run this code with 3.7 or 3.6, but it's always good to be up to date. If we take a look at our test case, I have my test underscore search PY module. And inside of here, I have my test function test basic duck duck go search. In my code, you'll notice that I have a bunch of these things called pages. These are my page objects. I have all of my steps and comments given when and then. And then you'll notice that my page objects are making all of my different calls, even for the assertions. So let's step through this test case piece by piece. The first thing I want to draw your attention to here is the signature. We've named it weld test basic DuckDuckGo search so that we know in the log when this test case fails exactly what the behavior it was covering is. 
You may also be curious to know why this function has an argument in it called browser. Whenever a PyTest test case has an argument named in it, usually that means that that is a fixture. In PyTest, fixtures are like setup and cleanup functions. They'll set th some things up for you before the test, and then once the test is complete, it'll do some cleanup and teardown actions. So here I have a fixture called browser that I'm using. So where is the browser fixture? You could put the browser fixture in the same module, but I like to put my fixtures in a separate file called conftest.py. The conf test file is PyTest's configuration file. It's a place to put any sort of shared pieces that multiple test modules will need. And so here in my conf test py module, I've put a fixture called browser. The names must match. My browser fixture will initialize and also quit my Selenium WebDriver instance. So here I've imported the PyTest module and I've imported the Selenium WebDriver module. I've created a function called browser and I've affixed the PyTest fixture decorator so that PyTest knows that this is a fixture. And in my browser function, I'm going to set up my WebDriver. To set up the WebDriver is pretty simple. I'm gonna say B equals Selenium WebDriver Chrome. What this will do in this one line it will start my Chrome driver on my local machine, which will then create a new instance of the Chrome browser on my machine. And when this runs, you'll actually see an, a browser open up to an empty page. I could have used any browser here. I could have used Firefox. I could have used, I, oh, I couldn't use IE on a Mac, but I could use Safari, I could use Opera. I'm just gonna use Chrome for the sake of our demo here tonight. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set a browser configuration setting. I want my browser to implicitly wait up to 10 seconds for elements to appear. What this means is that I'm avoiding race conditions, right? Anytime you load a web page, you need to wait for things to appear, right? And that can be slow and tedious depending on how fast your web application is. If I were to try to click on an element in my test automation before the page is loaded, then the click will fail, the test automation will crash, and most likely the test will yield a failure. That's the worst kind of web UI race condition there is because it's completely avoidable, yet it's very, very common to hit that in the industry for those who don't code their test cases carefully. So by putting an implicit weight here, WebDriver will be smart. If it can't find that element right away, it'll do a smart wait and repeatedly check back for up to 10 seconds. And once that element appears within that 10 second time limit, then it'll move forward. If that element doesn't appear in 10 seconds, then and only then will it crash and time out. So that's all I really need to do to configure my WebDriver. You can do other things like maximize the screen or, um, maybe provide the headless option if you want to do headless Chrome, but this, this will meet our purposes for now. Finally, what we want to do is we want to return a reference to that web driver because that's what our test is going to need in order to send those web driver commands. Now you may be wondering, why am I using a yield here instead of a return statement? Well, fixtures are not just once and done kind of things. You can make fixtures generators, meaning to have multiple return values in succession. If I make my fixture a generator using the yield command, what happens is anything before the yield will be executed as part of the test cases setup before the test body runs. And then anything after the yield statement will be run as a cleanup routine after the test completes, whether the test passes or fails. So that's a safety thing. So after the test is complete, I want to make sure I quit my web driver process. If I don't quit my web driver process, what could happen is that browser instance might still be running on your machine and you'll have zombie processes that are eating up system resources. 
This may not be such a big problem on your local machine because you'll see it and close it. But if you're running this in continuous integration, say on a Jenkins server or in Team City or whatever other CI tool you use, that slow creep and that zombie process can eat up those resources, slow down other build jobs, and possibly even lock resources that you can't delete and bring down entire pipelines. So always, always, always make sure you quit your web driver. You never want to do that inside the test case because if there was, if there's a failure or an exception inside the test case, that logic won't get executed. But if you put it here in a fixture like this, no matter what happens in the test case, this cleanup routine will be executed. So that's a long description for a four line function, <laughs> but it's very important that we understand this. So my fixture is named browser. When I declare it here as an argument, PyTest, when it discovers and executes this test case, will identify this fixture, execute the fixture, and pass whatever is returned by the fixture setup into this function as an input. So now I can use that browser instance in my test case. What I want to do with that browser is I want to pass that into my page object calls. Remember I said before, we don't want to make raw calls to Selenium WebDriver. We want to use page objects to model our interactions. And so I have these page object classes that will have a reference to my WebDriver. <coughs> so let's take a look at our page objects. My given and my when steps use the search page. There are two primary interactions that the search page needs to do. We need to load the search page, given the DuckDuckGo homepage is displayed. And we need to perform a search on the search page when the user searches for Panda. So I have my search page with two different methods, one of them no arguments, the other one of which takes in a search phrase. I put my page objects in a separate package. I put these um, page objects in a separate package. And I like to do that because um, it makes them more reusable. So here I have a pages package. You might want to name it a little bit better if you have a larger test project, but since this is small and, and trivial, I shouldn't say trivial. Since it's a much, much smaller project used for teaching, pages is probably a, a decent name. It has an init.py file to denote that it is a real package. And I've got my search module and result module, each of which has the respective page object. So close that out. My search module has my DuckDuckGo search page. I'm importing some things here from the Selenium WebDriver API. And the structure of a page object is fairly straightforward. We'll have locators and other variables. <coughs> we'll have an initializer met or, uh, method that will take in a reference to the WebDriver and store it. That's the stealth.browser. And then we have the interaction methods. So these methods were what were called from our test case. The load method oops, is going to load up the web page. The call to do that is simply self.browser.get. Now I'm going to pass in the URL to the duck.go homepage. And that's all there is to it. This will load up that page. Note that it won't wait for the page to be fully loaded. It simply initiates the loading of that page. The search method is a little bit more interesting. What the search method needs to do is it needs to find the search input element and then send the search phrase to it that we passed in. So two steps here. To find an element, we're going to say self.browser.findElement. And we need to pass in what we call a locator. A locator is a query 
that will try to find the web element on the web page. My locator here is this search input tuple. I like to put my locators at the top as class attributes. I like to put them in caps to denote that they are um, supposed to be immutable. And I like to write them as tuples because a locator has two parts. It has a locator type that's given by this by, and it has a locator query. So if I want to find the search input, I want to find it by the ID search form input homepage. You may be wondering where I got that from. If I go to the DuckDuckGo homepage myself, anytime I want to look at the source code of a page, I can right click on any element in Chrome and go to inspect. Inspect will open Chrome's dev tools. And you'll see that element that you clicked on will be highlighted here. You, if you try to hover over other elements, you'll notice that the page highlights correspondingly with them. Furthermore, if you want to pick new elements on the page, if you choose this cursor icon up here, you can highlight elements here and then they'll go to wherever they are in the source code. So I want the search bar and I'll notice it's this element here. It's an input element with ID, class, all these kinds of things. I like to use IDs whenever possible because they're simple locators and they're unique on the page. So that's how I got the ID search form input homepage for this search bar. In fact, let me see if I can make the text a little bit bigger there. So there we go, search form input homepage. That's how I got that locator. So I put my locator here, I make it a tuple because there are other kinds of locator types. You could look up things by class name. You could look up things by CSS selector. You could look up things by XPath. I always recommend get the simplest one that'll uniquely identify your elements. Put all my locators here so I can reuse them by other calls. I pass them into my find elements. I use this asterisk here to expand my tuple into positional arguments because the find element method actually takes two positional arguments, the type and the query. And when this call runs, if that element exists on the page, it will return an element object <laughs> representing that element to which I can send commands. So I'm going to name that search input. Once I have that input element to send, the key, to send my phrase, I'll say search input send keys. That's sending keystrokes. And I'll send the inputted phrase as well as keys.return because I want to hit enter after I type in so it commits the search. So there's a lot going on in this very, very simple page object class. Even though we only have a few lines of Python, there are some fairly, fairly complex and fairly powerful things going on. Going back to our test case, we can take a look at the result page as well. Now, the result page is used not so much for sending interactions, but rather for verifying things on the page because we want to make sure that certain things appear on our results page in order to declare our test case a success. The result page is used primarily for checking assertions. So we need to scrape things from that page and then make our various assertion calls. So the result page methods, things like getting the title, getting search input values, and getting link titles will be returning values. So here in my results page, I have a similar pattern. I have locators, and here not only do I have a, a search input locator by ID, but I also have an example of a CSS selector locator. I have my initializer method to store a browser reference. And then in my interaction methods, I'm going to be trying to getting things and returning them. So when I get my title, that's easy, self.browser.title send it back. When I want to get my search input value, 
I'm going to find my element for my search input. And then to get its text value, I'm going to say search input get attributes value and then return that text based value. And finally, for the result link titles, I'm going to do a similar thing. I'm going to use my locator for my result links. But this time, instead of finding a single element, I want to find multiple elements. Find elements, plural. It's possible for a locator to return a list of elements instead of just one. Because I want to check every single one of those links. So again, I pop in my locator and I'll get a list of links. Then what I want to do is I want to get the textual titles from those links. I don't want the link objects themselves. So I'm going to do a basic list comprehension here. My titles will be link.text for each link in my list of links. I'm basically doing a mapping here. I'm saying, you know, just convert your list of links into a list of those titles by getting their text attributes. And then return that list of titles. So then, back in my test case, we can see here, when I want to verify that the result title contains panda, I'm going to say assert that my phrase is in results page title. <coughs> when I want to verify that my search result query is my search phrase, I'm going to say my phrase, assert that my phrase equals results page search input value. And when I want to make sure that my search result links all pertain to Panda, I'm going to get a list of those titles. I'm going to try to match all of my titles against my search phrase in lowercase text, because we need to normalize that. And I just want to make sure that I at least got one successful result link. So that's how I can use page objects as part of my test case. So that's how we would write a test case top to bottom. Um, there's lots of little parts and it is a little bit complex, but hopefully it doesn't come across as too complicated. When you apply a design pattern like the page objects, you'll see how nicely your test case steps will be implemented. So let's run this bad boy. To run my test cases, since I'm using pipmv, I'll need to say pipmv run. Then the command to run pytest will be python-m pytest. Pytest will search the current directory and any subdirectories for test functions and test modules, and then it will run them all together. So when I hit enter here, what we should see is that pytest launches. We should see the Chrome web browser pop up and we should see it magically do its, excuse me, its web interactions. And I promise you, I won't be guiding it. I'll be hands off. So here we go. Hands off the keyboard. You can see Chrome pop up. It does the search, loads the page and boom. The test was pretty fast. It only took six and a half seconds. And we can see that it passed. Nice. So that is our first web UI test in Python using PyTest and Selenium WebDriver. If you want to learn more, like I said, I recommend this um, tutorial in GitHub, TAU Intro to Selenium PY, and just follow the README instructions. Once you do all that, if you want to keep practicing, I recommend trying some independent exercises. If you set this up, you will have the starting point of a Python test automation project that you can extend with other tests. So here are some ideas for other tests you can write on your own. 
Maybe you want to search for different phrases. Maybe you want to do an image search or a video search. Maybe you want to verify autocomplete suggestions pertaining to the search text. Furthermore, I also have a bunch of other additional resources listed at the bottom. So I hope that can inspire y'all and help y'all to do some testing and automation on your own. Uh, finally, I'll just pop this up here, uh, screenshot it, take it, just some high level resources I recommend. Um, I strongly recommend going to Test Automation University, not just for Python, but for other courses as well. Like I said, I have an upcoming course for an introduction to Selenium with Python. I've also written other courses for Web Element Locator Strategies. So if you want to learn more about whether you should use a CSS selector or an XPath for finding your uh, locators, great course to take. I also have a course on PyTest BDD if you want to get into behavior-driven development. Um, I blog at automationpanda.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at automationpanda. Um, and for other testing resources, you can look at Python Testing with PyTest, Brian Ockin's book, as well as the Ministry of Testing website. So um, that concludes the presentation part of my webinar. Uh, if anybody has questions, uh, you can ask them now, put them in the Q&A, drop them in the chat, and I'll oops, try to answer them. Uh, for some reason, my Q&A is not expanding. <laughs> oh, gosh. So we have two questions is here. I can read okay. them from you. Sure, sure, thank you. Uh, one says, is it similar to QA? Sorry, what? It says, is it similar to QA? Is, is what similar to QA? Um, we might have to, we need uh, the person to probably explain a little bit more that question. And okay. then the other one says, how big should a test case be? Oh, that's a great question. How big should a test case be? I always recommend make a test case as small as you can because smaller tests are more maintainable and more focused. Uh, the, the test case you saw that I wrote, uh, let me pull it up again. Uh, is my screen still presenting? Yes. Okay, so can y'all see the, the code again? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So like this test case is what I would consider about average size for, for the test cases I write. Maybe a little bit small, but um, <clears throat> you know, it, it doesn't need to be much, right? I like to have layers to my test solution so that I don't have too much code in any one place. So, um, like most of my test cases are going to be about five to 10 steps long. And each step is maybe only a couple lines of Python code. And then that's calling things like page objects or Selenium web driver calls. That the, the bite size approach to test cases means that you're going to stay focused. You're going to um, stay atomic. Um, you're going to keep that code maintainable. You're going to keep that code easy to read for the next person. <laughs> So yeah, short and sweet is good. Awesome. Okay, here is another question. So you send implicity on the underscore wait provided 10 seconds. What is the recommended wait time in seconds in general? Ooh, that is an excellent question. Let me pop that code back up here. So what is the best wait time for test cases? If you're... Oh, let me preface this by saying it depends on your web application under test. If you have a small test solution, then setting a universal wait time implicitly like this is an okay practice. I would say, you know, order of magnitude, 100 test cases or less. What I found for, for a lot of like big applications Usually somewhere between 10 seconds and 30 seconds is appropriate. Like DuckDuckGo is lightning fast and Google's also lightning fast and Wikipedia is pretty fast too. So you don't need a super long wait time. However, if some, <coughs> pardon me, not every web application has the same scale. And so I've worked on plenty of web applications that need 
about a minute to think. And that's just, whether it's good or bad, it is what it is. So I would say tune that to whatever the web application you're testing is. Now, if you are writing a fairly large test automation solution, a universal implicit weight is not practical because you'll find that the different interactions you'll need to do throughout your web application will need different wait times. Certain things can be very quick and should have a short wait time, while other things may take a long time to load. In those cases, you'll need to use what's called explicit weighting. Uh, if you go to, let me pull this up again, that WebDriver API documentation, uh, WebDriver API explicit weight Python. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Here we go. So this page will explain the difference between implicit and explicit weights. So here at the bottom, it'll show the implicit weight, which I showed in my example code. But it'll also explain what an explicit weight is and how to do it. An explicit weight is applied for each interaction rather than once for all. So you have to write more code, you have to be more thoughtful, but it provides more fine grained control over your weighting. So I would say learn about both of them and then make your best judgment based on the needs of your application. I hope that helps. Awesome, here is another question. What are other misconceptions about using PyTest and Unitest? What are misconceptions about using PyTest and unit test? Um, <clears throat> well, I, the big one, like I mentioned before, is um, that these are all classified as unit test frameworks when they can be used for more than unit testing. Um, and it, it's particularly bad with the unit test framework because it's named unit test. Um, I don't know if there are any other major misconceptions with unit test or pi test. Um, what I can say, I can talk about some of the differences between the two because unit test and pi test are, are both the most used. I think pi test has a bit more usage than unit test these days. But um, to describe unit test, uh, let me pull up a page here, Python unit test. <clears throat> here we go. Unit test is Python's out of the box unit testing framework. It comes with the standard library and it's, it's fairly bare bones, basic and simple. What's nice is that you get it out of the box. When you write your unit test test cases, it's similar to other X unit style frameworks in other languages and that you will have a class that is a subclass of the test case class. And each test method inside of this test case class is a test case. You can also add, uh, let's see, they have an example here. You can also add setup and teardown functions that will be executed before and after each test case respectively. Personally, I think PyTest is better than unit test, even though PyTest is a third party package, because PyTest is more flexible and more concise. I don't like this model of writing classes for test cases. I think writing functions for test cases is, is much more in line with what a test case should fundamentally be. And we don't need these setup and cleanup methods because we have fixtures. Uh, one problem I have with setup and cleanup methods is that they are limited to the scope of the class in which they're contained. Fixtures can be used by any test case anywhere in your project. They're not limited in scope by a particular containing class. Uh, <coughs> you don't need to mess with inheritance either, which makes your functions much more flexible in PyTest. So both, both are decent. I mean, don't feel like using don't feel like using unit test is wrong necessarily. 
I just think PyTest is a whole lot better. Oh, and another thing with PyTest is that it's extendable with plugins. Unit test does not have a, a plugin capability, whereas PyTest does. You can write all sorts of plugins for PyTest for things like doing code coverage or generating HTML reports or writing your test cases in Gherkin with PyTest BDD or parallelizing your tests with PyTest XDist. So PyTest is just much, much more flexible and extendable than unit test. Awesome. Thank you. We have a couple more questions. Keep them coming. What about testing data visualizations? Testing database. No, data visualizations. Um, I mean, you can, you can test things in the database too. So um, when it comes to test cases, um, what can I say? Let's see here, let me just come back to the code. When it comes to test cases, if you can describe it, you can do it. So if, if you want to make test cases for database queries, absolutely, you can. Uh, if you want to make um, test cases for database triggers, that might be a little bit more complicated. I don't, because triggers are usually something that are like inside the database. Um, <coughs> Typically though, I would say you, if I would ask what your database is being used for. Um, are, you, are you using a database behind a service layer and then all of your requests are coming through that service layer and only that service will ever access the database? If that's the case, you may not necessarily want to write tests for the database itself. You may want to write tests for the, um, for the services instead. Or another example is if you're using Django and you have an ORM, or if you're using Flask with SQL Alchemy, and SQL Alchemy is your ORM. You don't necessarily need to test the database directly because Django and SQL Alchemy, I'm sure, have plenty of unit tests that cover uh, the, making sure that the database works correctly with your ORM so that you can just simply test your data models instead. Uh, if you're talking about database visualizations, um, I would say, okay, well, however, whatever software is um, doing the visualization for you, I'm sure you could find a way to test that. Typically, I'm not a big fan of testing visuals with automation because visuals can be kind of hard to codify, though there are now tools like Applet Tools that can do visual testing for you. Awesome. And uh, let's see, from your experience, any significant differences when testing different web frameworks like Yango, Pyramid, and Flask? Ooh, that is a great question. So um, when Python has some awesome web frameworks, I've done extensive work in Django. I've not done Pyramid, but I know about it, and I've touched Flask, and it looks pretty cool. Every, every web framework in Python has its own intricacies, its own purpose, its own nuances, right? And so when you, when you test the web applications that you develop in Python, remember what I said before about there being two kinds of test cases. You can test code and you can test features. I recommend you test both. When it comes to testing code, um, that's when you're going to be testing code within that particular framework. So for example, in Django, you have a test client. That test client can do things like testing models, testing views, basically creating a dummy server for you and providing content to it with a test, a temporary test database that gets torn down after the tests, right? Um, I don't know if Flask has any testing stuff out of the box, but I'm pretty sure there's probably, I'm pretty sure there's a, a PyTest plugin for Flask where you can test things there. So those are the kinds of things you would want to use when testing the code within your framework, doing your unit tests, testing your utility functions, and then using whatever tools the framework provides for testing. 
When it comes to doing the black box end to end testing of, let's say, you know, bringing up the web application in Chrome or Firefox, you would do exactly what I showed you tonight with Selenium. Selenium web driver based tests, like the ones we saw here, don't care what the underlying web framework is. You could be doing something in Angular JS, total mean stack, all JavaScript. You could be doing something entirely in Django with statically delivered pages. You could be serving up a hybrid solution. <coughs> Selenium doesn't care. All Selenium does is interact with the elements that are displayed on the page. So however those elements got there, whatever generated that, that HTML and that CSS, Selenium can handle it all. Awesome, thank you. Here is another question. We can have implicit underscore weight in the setup as you use and have explicit weight in a specific test. I mean, having both within our oh. separate project. Yeah, oh, that's, that's a great thing to bring up. Unfortunately, as a best practice, you should never mix implicit weights with explicit weights. Th that comes directly from the Selenium project maintainers. They recommend very, very much that you do not do that. And the reason why you should not mix those two is because it can cause very, very wonky things in the web driver. Unfortunately, you've got to choose one or the other. You've got to set an implicit weight and set that for your whole project, or you've got to use explicit weights for all your different calls. Awesome, thank you. The web UI I am working on I am working on have a lot of maps. Can we use PyTest for interacting with maps for testing with maps? Hmm. When when you say maps, um, I would ask what what does that mean? Like, is that something that appears on the page or? Um, oh, you mean like like Google Maps, like that kind of map? Yeah, it might be. Okay, so I, I can answer for answer for that. If you've got something like Google Maps or Apple Maps, um, there's a, a couple ways to handle that. So usually maps will appear as like a widget inside your page, or they'll appear as like you know some sort of drop in. Uh, assuming it's not like the full page, like you're. I'm assuming you're not testing Google Maps itself, but rather you have like a landing page for your business and you're showing the map for where the headquarters is or something. So like I said before, traditional test automation is not so great at testing visuals. Um, I've never had to do direct interactions with a map itself. I would assume that there's some sort of uh, there's some sort of graphical HTML elements in there you may be able to queue off of, but if not, then I would recommend writing your tests to do things like um, do triggering interactions on the page that would have an effect on those maps. For example, let's say that there's a an address bar somewhere on the page. Maybe you could type in your address and then hit enter and then verify that the map refreshes to show that particular address, something like that. Or you may just want to look at some automated visual testing solutions, like what Apple tools does, or I believe the, there's a project called Selenium base in Python. They also have some, some basic visual testing aids in there as well. Awesome. Thank you. Do you prefer PyTest over, Test NG with Java? Absolutely, yes. All day, every day. <laughs> Not to say Test NG is bad. Test NG is a wonderful framework. But in my opinion, which is not necessarily fact, I am a Pythonista at heart. I love Python. I believe Python is the best, test, uh, the best language for test automation out there right now. And I believe PyTest is the best test automation framework free open source test automation framework in any major language right now. 
Awesome. What are some test cases that new programmers forget to include for Django web applications? Hmm, common test cases that people overlook. Well, if we're talking about Django specifically, and we're talking about testing code before we talk about testing features. A lot of, um, first of all, some people just don't write tests at all. <laughs> so if you, are, if you are trying to write some tests, that's the first good step. Um, common tests that people will forget will be things like, um, in Django, testing any methods that you add to your data models or um, making sure certain things appear in your views or testing some utility methods or filters, right? Another thing I can say is in a lot of frameworks, people will, um, people will use the framework just by itself and they won't try to add any extra design or patterns in there. So they'll just cram all of their code into like action methods or into um, you know view functions or something instead of thinking, well, maybe I should have a library for this. Maybe I should have a class with a module or something. So thinking along those terms, I would say design your application well and then apply your you know, unit tests appropriately wherever you're adding custom logic. Now, when it comes to the feature level for tests, um, things that people commonly forget, hmm, that's, that's a tricky question because it's so based on context. Um, the things that people forget are often kind of like, you know, obvious edge cases, <laughs> not like, you know, weird hunkered down edge cases, but things like, hey, you know, if you close this particular uh, tab, can you reopen it? <laughs> Or um, things like if you if you save this data and then reload the page, make sure that it comes back the way it was saved. Stuff like that, people kind of overlook things that get taken for granted that maybe should not be. That's what I would say. Okay, the next one is: Do you define you you testing as functionality testing? Oh, so we're going to play the definitions game here. So um, always be careful with definitions and words whenever you're talking in the testing space. Testing is a very, very opinionated space. I would argue even more so than the developer space. So when we talk about, or when we use the phrase functional testing, I consider a functional test to be any kind of test that verifies the functionality of a feature or code by yielding a pass or fail result. It either works or it doesn't. That's contrasted from say a performance test, which is trying to determine if a feature works well under given conditions for given metrics, where a performance test is not a hard pass or fail, but rather some sort of metric that you're measuring. So with my definitions, I would say absolutely yes. UI, web UI testing is a form of functional testing. I am trying to exercise behavior in my web application in a black box manner to determine if this functionality is working or not. Um. I miss one question to read. Okay, testing media elements like audio, is that possible? Uh, yes, uh, basically Selenium WebDriver can interact with anything that appears on a web page. So if it's like, if it's some sort of like drop-in for an, a media element that has like an HTML tag or something, uh, you, can, you can interact with it. Um, I, going back to the maps question earlier, like, I mean, if, if there's any elements in there, then yeah, you can, if, if something's exposed, you can interact with those elements as well. Now you may not be able to, um, or it may not be easy to interact with everything on the page, um, right? 
for example, like a, a basic button on a page is going to have like an input element or a button element or some sort of hyperlink element in the HTML. And you can write a locator for that element you know, by ID or by CSS selector. And when you get that element, you can say element.click. For some more complicated stuff, you may have to end up doing pixel math. Uh, like with the maps, like I've never done anything with maps, so I'm really not 100% sure. But in the worst case scenario, in Selenium, if you need to, you can, you can drop the pixels and try to mess around with that. Or you can drop to raw JavaScript and manipulate things that way. Those are typically not best practices because they tend to be very fragile. So anytime you find yourself in that situation, you may want to ask yourself, is that test case worth automating? For the amount of effort I'm going to put into writing the Python code for that, figuring out all the intricacies of Selenium WebDriver, and then maintaining it in the future when it inevitably breaks, is that worth the effort I'm putting in, in terms of return on investment? Okay, the next one is, do you find Faker is a good way to put test data or do you prefer other packages to add temporary data? Yeah, it's a great question. So there are plenty of packages to get fake data. Uh, let me just pull up Faker real quick to refresh my memory. Uh, faker test data. Here we go. Faker read the docs. Python package that generates fake data for you. Yeah. So this is just, yeah. Okay. It's just generating boom, boom, boom. So <clears throat> I think Faker's great. I don't think it's like a, a must have, but it's, it's pretty good in certain circumstances. Um, Typically, my perspective is that when it comes to functional testing, whether that's testing code or testing features, I typically don't like randomness in my data. I like to have everything spelled out as equivalence classes because that way I know that I'm catching all the cases that I intend to catch. And any sort of randomness could cause uncertainty to happen in my test results. And I don't like that type of intermittency. However, there are times, particularly with data-driven testing, where you need to generate lots of data and lots of fake data. And you need it to be somewhat realistic. Like here, um, if you need a name or you need an address, that can be very, very useful because you can only come up with so many things on your own. It's, it's time consuming, it's tedious. And so this is where a, a library like Faker shines. So yeah, I'd say Faker's great. Another package you may want to look into is called Hypothesis. Hypothesis is a way, it, it, it's a, wow. Hypothesis is a library for property-based testing. Or instead of specifying hard equivalence classes or specific inputs or um, using a library like Faker, you set a range of inputs. That's the property. And Hypothesis will just crank through all different kinds of inputs that will qualify for that property, for that range. Excuse me. And it's basically like a sledgehammer to your tests. So it's trying to throw everything it possibly can that could potentially be considered valid at your test case or at your, at your, at the thing you're testing. And if the whole range is good, then it'll pass. And if there are any edge cases that broke, it'll tell you right away. Now, one thing to keep in mind with an approach like that, that's great for unit testing. That's horrible for web UI testing. Because for a, a single property range, there could be thousands of, um, of input combinations that Hypothesis will generate for you. And if you just have like one simple search test and all of a sudden now you're doing a thousand searches, 
right? If your test case takes a minute, one test case, one web UI test case takes a minute to run, you've just taken 17 hours to run one test case with all the different variations of hypothesis. That's not ideal. So keep that in mind whenever you're, you're trying to generate fake test data. Okay, I have one last question, no, two more. Uh, PyTest has features based on different scopes, class, module, function, session. How do you determine which scope to use in a test? Hmm, that depends on what you're trying to do with your fixture. So let me pull up my code again. Here's my fixture. I have not explicitly set any scope for it, which means it's taking the default scope, which means it's going to be test case scope. I forget what, what name they give it. It might be function. And I think this is called function scope. But essentially, this fixture, because I have not explicitly set a scope, will run one time for each test case. And that's exactly what I want for web UI testing. I want each one of my web UI tests to have its own web driver instance. I want each test to set up a fresh web driver instance at the start of the test and tear it down at the end of the test. And I want the next test to do the same thing with its own instance. We should not share web driver instances across tests because web driver itself can be a little bit touchy. The longer a web driver instance lives, the flakier it becomes. <laughs> so you want its lifespan to be short. Furthermore, if you were to share web driver instances across tests, that would break test case independence. If something crashes in one test with that web driver, it would inherently, or it would immediately then crash the other test because you wouldn't be restarting. So that is a case where I'd want to make sure my scope is per test case. Now, a, a case where you might want to use something like session scope, in which session scope runs the fixture one time for the entire test suite, once for all tests instead of once for each test, would be if you're reading a configuration file. And in fact, I show this example in that tutorial project that I have on GitHub. In that example, I create a config file called config.json, and I put in various input values, such as the type of browser I want to use and the number of seconds to use for that implicit weight. And I, I create a fixture called config that will read in that data or read in that JSON file at the start of the test suite. And I wanted to have session scope because I don't want each test case to reread that config file. The config file should never change. In fact, it shouldn't change in the middle of testing. And so it's redundant and wasteful to waste the time to reread that file for every single test. So that would be an example of when I'd want to use session scope. So yeah, it all comes down to what you want your fixtures to do. Awesome, I think that's the last question. Great. And they said that thank you so much for answering all the questions as well. No worries, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And remember everyone that we are, we help events every month. So you can check our website, womenwhocode.com slash Python. And we are all in Twitter and all the social media as uh, Women Who Code Python as well. So if you have any questions as well, you can, you can ask us anywhere. I also share uh, your blog and, and the um, GitHub link so everyone can. Great, thank you. And I see you share the LinkedIn too. I didn't have it, so I share your tweet. <laughs> no worries. At the meantime.
Alrighty, I hope everyone has a good evening or morning or afternoon. <laughs> it's kind of hard to define what to say in that moment. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining and thank you for inviting me. This was quite a lot of fun. I hope this was helpful. Yeah, for sure. Thank you very much for giving us your time tonight.